I spent uh, a majority of my time on earth playing in bands. So this is something kind of natural for me to, to step over and, and uh, be a part of this worship event. And so I, I have some pictures here. And so those, those are, that's me. So I'm, I'm a, eh. those two big ones, I'm in my early 20s probably. Uh, what the, I'm, that's North Carolina there. I live and played in North Carolina for a while. I think the middle one is Florida. Uh, it's a, I can't remember the town, doesn't matter. It's some place that had a stage, and so I was there playing. And then that bottom one, I don't know if, uh, if you know who Dr. John is, but he was a musician uh, for a long time. He had this song in the 60s, it might have been a right place, must have been a wrong, if you ever heard that. <laughs> if you've ever heard the Blossom theme song, then he sang the Blossom theme song. And so this is a picture uh, where we were doing the show with Dr. John was there and B.B. King and, and this sort of thing. And the, the bread and butter of being a starting musician in a, a working band, if you're not Dr. John's caliber, is you get to open up. You're the opening band for some of these things. If you've ever been to see a concert and you're, you're all excited and then some band comes out that you've never heard of and you have to listen to them for 45 minutes, that was me. I was, I, was, I was in that band that you've never heard of for 45 minutes. <laughs> and so we did a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of opportunities to open up for these bands, and you get to go there, and they'd be setting, they wouldn't be setting up their stuff. They'd have roadies there, also, of course, and they're set, roadies are setting up all the band's gear. The band's off in the hotel. You never see them because they're, uh, you know, they've reached a level where they don't have to carry their own guitars anymore. And you'd be sitting there thinking, one day, I'm not going to have to carry my guitar anymore, like like I have to now, because these guys don't even have to, they don't have to tune their own guitars. Like that's that's going to be the life. And so I spent a lot of years opening up for, for bands. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I'm not going to tell this story in the sermon, but remind me later to tell my Pat Benatar story. Sorry if you're, wa- <laughs> sorry if you're watching online, but it's kind of, uh, it's humorous and it's not my story, it's someone else's, but I'm a, I'll tell it when we're not being recorded. And so uh, so uh, that, was, that was the life, the life of, of an opening band. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about John the Baptist this morning. And why do I say this? Because I kind of think as, of John the Baptist as Jesus' opening act. It might be uh, blasphemous, but I'm, I said it anyway. And so John the Baptist is in ev- all four Gospels. He's a, a, a very important person at this time, and we really don't talk about him very often, and he's mysterious in a lot of ways. There's not a lot written about him. We have the four gospel accounts, and then some other uh, early historians, Roman historians, also about this guy named John the Baptist, so he does exist. He was there, and there are a few things that we, that we know about him. From the gospel of Luke, we know that, that John is Jesus' cousin. We read about this at the very first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. He had the appearance of a prophet. What this means is he, we read of him having a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt, and he eats locusts and wild honey and lives out in the desert. And when a careful Jewish student of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures hears, hears this description of John the Baptist, they immediately think of Elisha out uh, Elijah wore the same clothes and ate the same food, and so you're supposed to instantly uh, be taken back and, and be reminded of what a prophet is and what a prophet does and all the great things that the prophets have done throughout history. So like I said a little bit earlier, John offered a once and for all baptism. Uh, historically, you would have to be ritually bathed to purify yourself, to enter into the temple, uh, for Passover, for all these sorts of things. Uh, you would have to ritually bathe on occasions. And John was offering something different. He was offering a once and for all baptism out in the Jordan River away from the temple. He was saying, I offer this baptism here once and for all, once and for all baptism because I'm here to prepare the way of the Lord. I'm here to set everything straight and get you ready for the Lord because the Lord is coming and and John the Baptist is out in the desert preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. John the Baptist had a lot of followers. He uh, ruffled a lot of feathers around town. He was preparing the way for Jesus to come, and many of Jesus' disciples were originally John the Baptist's 
disciples. And so that's why he uh, has such a presence in the four gospels is because he was a very important person in their lives. Not as important as, of, as Jesus, obviously, and so that's why you get a chapter rather than 30. But John the Baptist was, had a, played a very important role in, in the lives of these people. And so we're gonna dig now into our gospel reading, Matthew 4. And uh, here, we're gonna read it here. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, John the Baptist had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali. There we go. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah that we just heard, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For the from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, Simon the Rock Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Word of God, word of life. I want to focus on just two things here. We read a lot, but I want to focus on, on two things that we just read. John had been put in prison. John the Baptist, Jesus' opening act, had been put in prison, so we're going to talk about that. And uh, John the Baptist uh, has been preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And we're going to do this quickly, and I promise it's not going to be as boring as it looks. When I see a map, I, do, I glaze over. But this is actually really fascinating. Uh, and this is something I, I didn't uh, know until I was starting to research for, for this sermon. Uh, and this is, this is fascinating. So this is Israel in the time of Jesus. Those colored regions are areas of land. You have Galilee. We just read about Jesus uh, going to Galilee. So Galilee's way up there, the Sea of Galilee, Nazareth, all those towns we read about are up there in that red circle. Down below is uh, Judea, Jerusalem is down there in that red circle. And then there's Samaria, you read about the Samaritan woman, we read about all these places in the Bible. And so you have uh, Galilee and Jesus' ministry up here, and you have Jerusalem down, uh, down here in that red circle. And so Herod the Great was a, a Jewish ruler, and the Romans loved Herod the Great because he went along with the program. This is Herod the, Herod the Great's family tree. Don't need to know about it. I just wanted to show you that all those top uh, row, that top row of boxes are Herod's wives. He had a lot of wives. He was a king. What are you going to do about it? So uh, we're not, we're not, we're not going to talk about them, but Herod the Great dies, and Israel is divided between his sons. And we saw those colored regions there. Those are typically two of Herod's wives. Miriam and I can't even remember, Malthus, the, his wives, had two sons. Uh, sorry, three sons. One from one, two from the other. Uh, Herod Philip, Herod Archelaus, and Herod Antipas. Uh, and uh, it's almost like George Foreman, how George Foreman named all his kids George. And George. Uh, Herod the Great and his family did, did the same thing. So Herod the Great's land... Israel at the time of Jesus was divided between these three people, these three, two brothers and a cousin. Here we go, get ready. So there's uh, Archelaus down there, he's got Jerusalem. Philip over here has, has an area on one side of the Jordan River, and Antipas has an area on the other side of the Jordan River. And then we're going to zoom in up here, and we're going to focus on Antipas and Philip's Region. So there's the Sea of Galilee. We see the Jordan River running up through there. Antipas is on one side. He's got Capernaum and Cana and all these towns we read about. And then on the other side of the Jordan River is Philip. And right there in the middle at the Jordan River is our good friend John the Baptist. Uh, and so <clears throat> John the Baptist is here in the Jordan River preaching 
to these people, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. John likes to stir stuff up. And so we need to look at at one more of Herod the Great's wives. We're going to add one more. And so this wife had a son who had a daughter named Herodias. Very original. So Herod the Great's uh, granddaughter, Herodias. And one thing about Herodias is that she is married to Philip. So Philip is married to his niece, Herodias. They're kings. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> this, John can't handle this. Philip, why are you marrying your niece? Like he, he, he's pointing these things out to, to, these, to these rulers. Like, you, what's going on here? Philip says, ah, leave me alone, John. I don't want to deal with this. So, so John's in the, in the middle of this, starting to stir stuff up. Then another thing happened. Philip died. Herodias' husband, Philip, died. And so Herodias is now a widow. But then she marries Philip's brother, Antipas, his, whole, his full brother. So now uh, uh, Herodias has been married to, to two brothers. And John says, are you serious, Antipas? Yeah, he can't, he can't even handle anymore. And so Antipas says, bro, I'm so going to arrest you right now. And so Antipas arrests John the Baptist. John the Baptist is arrested because he's meddling in all of these affairs of the rulers and they don't like it. And he's arrested because he's starting to grow a following and they're afraid that uh, people won't listen to the rulers anymore. And they don't like John the Baptist pointing out the things that they're doing behind closed doors. So he's arrested and tucked away and we don't have to worry about him anymore. That's when, this is Jesus. That's when Jesus comes on the scene. This is Israel at the time of Jesus. And we read about his ministry starting here in this verse of Matthew. And so Jesus says, I know a great place to start my ministry. Right there. And he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. Jesus goes right back into the lion's den. The Bible uses the word Jesus uh, withdrew. But it's not a withdrawal. He's intentionally going to this place where there is tension, where things are being pointed out. He's intentionally carrying out the ministry and fulfilling the ministry that his cousin John the Baptist has begun. Jesus is preaching once again, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. And if you're a king, you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear that the kingdom of heaven is here. And so what is a kingdom? What words uh, come to mind when you think of a kingdom? If anyone has had enough coffee and is brave enough, what words are there words that you think about when you hear kingdom? You can say them out loud. It will be okay. Castle. Think of a castle. Anyone else think of any, any words? Ruler. Okay, excellent. Yeah, these are good. There's a castle there, so kingdom, right? I mean, these are awesome things. And so we need to, before we can fully understand what it means for John the Baptist to say the kingdom of heaven is here, and before we can fully understand what it means for Jesus to say the kingdom of heaven is here, we have to understand, well, what does that even mean? What is a, what is a kingdom? And so uh, if, if uh, we thought about it for a while, we'd come up with words like castle, we'd come up with words like ruler. I want to talk about uh, three worlds in particular. I want to talk about a kingdom has a territory, a kingdom has a king, and a kingdom has a law. So first, the territory. Obviously, the kingdom has to have land that the king rules over. We saw in, in, that, uh, in that map that Herod the Great ruled this land, and then his land was divided up. And so those were all kingdom. This was the kingdom of Herod the Great at the time, underneath the authority of Rome, the Roman Empire. So king has to ha- a kingdom has to have land. Can't have a, a kingdom without an area of existence for this kingdom to exist. And a kingdom also has to have a king. King Herod. A kingdom has to have a king. And it's a person that uh, rules over the kingdom. This person has total authority. What the king says goes, and everyone listens to the king and does the king's bidding. The king has full authority over this territory, over the kingdom. And a kingdom also has to have a law. It's the will of the king. What the king wants 
the law of the land to be, that's what the law of the land is. The kingdom has a territory and a king ruling over it, and the king's law is the governing authority over that entire territory. Does that kind of make sense? It's a kingdom. It's really not that complicated, but we don't think about it very often. We just don't, we don't think about it. We say the word kingdom of heaven without going through this exercise, and sometimes it's helpful. So now, what is the kingdom of heaven? If it's a kingdom, it has to have at least the same things that a, every other kingdom that exists has. And so it obviously has more than three things, three uh, main uh, aspects, just like a, the Herod the Great's kingdom had more than three aspects to it. But we're going to focus on, on these three uh, because it's, this will go on forever. So uh, the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven has a territory. We know the territory, our father who art in heaven. The kingdom of heaven is in heaven. We pray this, we pray this prayer every week when we're here, and some of us pray it uh, more often than that. And so we pray that our father who art in heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the territory of God's kingdom, is in heaven. We got a king, our father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. Whose kingdom? Thy's. Who's thy? It's God. God's kingdom come here on earth. And so the king of the kingdom of heaven is God. Again, these are not, uh, I don't expect to be telling anyone anything they don't know, but I like to go through this exercise. And the law, thy will be done. The governing authority over the entire kingdom is the will of the king. The rule of law for the entire kingdom is what the king has decreed. And so we pray, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's it's an area where God rules. It's an area where God has total sovereignty. It's an area where God, uh, God's law, his rule is obeyed by everyone and everyone submits to the, the authority of God. That's the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus comes on the scene uh, right after John the Baptist and says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. That's what we read in Matthew Jesus is preaching that the kingdom of heaven has come near. What does the kingdom of of heaven look like? All of this business of repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near, and then Jesus does a bunch of stuff. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven has come near, and this is what it looks like in the kingdom of heaven. This is what it looks like if we all follow, follow God's authority. First of all, the first thing we read about Jesus doing is calling disciples. Jesus goes out and, and uh, expands God's kingdom here on earth as in heaven. So that's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. It looks like invitation to everyone around us, to people we see. And once you're into the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven looks like the forgiveness of sins. We read elsewhere in the Bible that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins, and that uh, freaks some of the religious leaders out because only God can forgive sins. And so Jesus is making a claim about himself that he is God and he can forgive sins. We read here in Matthew about Jesus healing the sick. And there was a a belief and understanding, a feeling that at the time, if you were sick, then it had something to do with your sin or the sin of your parents or the sin of your family. The sickness that you felt was a physical manifestation of the sin in your life. And so for Jesus to heal someone is just another way for Jesus to forgive their sins. It says, the sin has put this upon you and I'm taking it away. I'm forgiving your sin. I'm taking all the consequence away from you. I'm bearing it on myself. So the kingdom of heaven is where sins are forgiven. The sick are healed. In the kingdom of heaven, we're a promised everlasting life. 
This is uh, one thing that Jesus promises over and over is everlasting life. Jesus uh, came and defeated uh, sin and death. And we're told that if we follow Jesus uh, here on earth, as we will in heaven, that we will have everlasting life. Here's the, here's the problem though, sorry. There's still sin. And there's still sickness. And our, our, our friends and family are still dying. <clears throat> it hasn't, uh, it doesn't uh, look like heaven uh, to me a lot of times when we're here. And so how do we reconcile then of uh, following Jesus and Jesus saying, in me you see the kingdom of heaven. I have defeated sin and death. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Where Jesus is, the kingdom of heaven is. Where two or more are gathered in the name of, and are, where two or more are gathered, Jesus promises to be in their midst, which means the kingdom of heaven is in the midst of those people. When they meet, the kingdom of heaven is here. There are two, more than two or three here this morning. So the kingdom of, of heaven is near right now. Does anyone, I, some of us still feel sick. Some of us are, are sick, sick. Some of us uh, are s- still sinning. Some of us uh, know people or, or in the, we're all in the process, I guess, of, of dying here. So what's, uh, what's going on? This just doesn't seem, it's like a, like a bait and switch almost. I don't quite understand but we're, we're still waiting for the encore. And this is something we don't talk about a lot. Where John the Baptist was uh, Jesus' opening act. Jesus is the main act. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has now come near. Forgiving sins. Raising the dead. Uh, healing people of their sicknesses. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus went faithfully to the cross, died, and was resurrected. That's the main act. But we're still waiting for the encore. Again, it's something we don't, we don't talk about a lot of the time, but Jesus promises to come back. I think there's, it's not done yet. There's still, show's not over, folks, right? I mean, just when you thought the show was over, uh, Jesus coming out to play Freebird, like the best song ever, right? I mean, it's, it's happening. It's be like uh, going to see Elvis and he doesn't play Love Me Tender. It's like, oh, he does that during the encore because everybody wants to hear it. Right? This is happening. It's still, it's still here. So our faith is in Jesus and his promise that the kingdom of heaven will be fully restored here on earth. We're promised that everything will be made new. That when Jesus comes again, everything will be made new. And when everything is made new, that's when we'll have the full realization of what it looks like to live in the kingdom of heaven. It's what we're we're waiting for. That's what our faith is in Jesus. And Jesus has proven himself to be faithful over and over to death. So we can have perfect faith in the fact that Jesus keeps his promises. But we're waiting. We're waiting for the encore. We're waiting for the kingdom of heaven to be fully restored here on earth. While we wait, we live under God's rule on earth as in heaven. Those of us that are, that are part of the church and part of the uh, group of people that is spreading the kingdom of heaven to those around us, we live under the authority of God. We have a new authority now. The kingdom of heaven is here. We live in the kingdom of heaven. And so while we are here, we live under God's authority. And we spread the good news of the kingdom to everyone that we meet. Just like Jesus immediately goes and finds people and says, follow me. The kingdom of heaven is here. Come. Come to the kingdom of heaven. The main act is about to begin. Opening act's over. Don't have to worry about that anymore. The main act is here. We're to spread the good news. We're to spread the good news of the kingdom. We read in our verse in Corinthians that this is foolish to those that are perishing. And you might be sitting there thinking that, well, this is foolish t- to me too. Like, what does it mean uh, for, the king, for everything to be made new? What does it mean? What's it going to look like? Uh, we're just having a conversation this morning about what's, what's 
heaven look like? Is it going to be uh, full of bad uh, Andy Griffith jokes? That's not very good. <laughs> what, what's, what's it going to be? The fact is we don't know. All we know is that we're promised that this turmoil that we're still in the midst of of will be over. That finding uh, ways to care for our sick and dying loved ones will never be a thing that we have to consider again for eternity. That's what we're promised. And it sounds foolish. It sounds foolish to people that don't know the love of Jesus. It sounds foolish to them, but to those that know, love, and understand Jesus' faithfulness, that know and understand God's love for them, that as outlandish as that may sound, that as perfect as that existence would be, as hard as that is to wake up on a cold and snowy morning, and you're cracking and aching and trying to get out, and you got a shovel, and you remember, oh yeah, well, my dad's in the hospital, and oh, well, this thing happened, and my job's gone to garbage. In the midst of all that, it's hard uh, to accept the fact that this perfection is actually out there, that this perfection is what we're waiting for. So this is a morning where I remind you that this is where we focus our eyes, not on things of the earth, we have an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven, an inheritance, an inheritance that is coming to us, an inheritance that we get to partake in, even though we're sinning constantly, even though we're not worthy, we get to partake in this eternal inheritance, this perfection, a perfection that as we talk about it, we can't even believe is real. We're promised this because of what Jesus did on that cross 2,000 years ago. Amen? Amen. 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 Will you pray with me? Uh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for John the Baptist's ministry 2,000 years ago that John the Baptist was out in the desert uh, being a rabble rouser, uh, pointing out the inequalities that existed in the earth's kingdoms, pointing out that uh, people are in need of repentance, pointing out that there is something better than what we have been living with to come. And so we thank you that Jesus came to fulfill John the Baptist's ministry. We thank you that for a brief moment in the history of the universe, you were physically here with us, physically here uh, raising people from the dead, physically here healing people, physically here uh, making us all see what the kingdom of heaven will look like. We thank you that we have the scriptures to read from to remind us that you were here as proof that your promise is real and as proof that we can put our faith in a very certain promise that you will come again. And so we wait here faithfully. We wait here expectantly. We wait here in the hopes that one day soon, you will be here to sort this all out, uh, to make us new again, to restore heaven and restore earth. And we will all live together in the kingdom of God under the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.